Are you tired of feeling like your body is constantly working against you? Do you struggle with unexplained illnesses or chronic health issues? Join Dr. Gabor as he unveils the hidden links between emotional stress and physical. Health in his eye-opening book and video series, The Body Says No. Gain insights into how your body's signals can reveal deeper truths about your well-being. And learn how to harness this wisdom for a healthier, happier life. Don't miss this opportunity to discover the profound impact of your mind on your body. Don't forget to like and subscribe to get notified when we publish a new video. The subject I'm addressing this morning is um, illness and what creates illness. And as a Western pain medical doctor, I was programmed really to see illness as a separate category distinct from health. And to see it, on, see it in purely physical terms, so if somebody gets cancer, somebody gets rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, ALS, Crohn's disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chronic asthma, chronic psoriasis, whatever it is, that's just a physical event in the body with no relationship to our emotions. And furthermore, the individual illness in a person is seen as separate from that person's life in a certain environment. So we separate the mind from the body in Western medicine and we separate the individual from the environment. Now, <clears throat> what's wrong with that, quite apart from the fact that it's not valid, it's also not even scientific in today's um, scientific sense, in that the research that shows that these separations are invalid has been done and published and it gets deeper and more proliferates more regularly and yet the insights of the science do not penetrate medical practice. The Buddha 2500 years ago said it best as he said many things best. He talked about what he called the interconnected core rising of phenomena and basically he said that nothing exists on its own. He said when you look at a leaf or a raindrop, meditate on the conditions near and distant that contributed to the presence of that leaf or raindrop. Know that the world, you know, and obviously in the leaf or the raindrop, there's the sky, there's the irrigation from the, from the clouds, there's the sun, without the life of which there could be no life, there's the earth, the minerals, the nutrition that goes into making that leaf. So he said, when you look at the leaf, you see the whole world. And he says, um, this is because that is, that is not because this is not, this is born because that is born, this dies, and because that dies, the birth and death of any phenomenon are connected to the birth and death of all other phenomenon. The one contains the many, the many contains the one. Now, in modern scientific terms, that could be called a biopsychosocial approach. And to, to give it its full name, it really might be called a biopsychospiritual approach. And what does that mean? It means really according to the North American native medicine wheel, human beings have their spiritual, physical, emotional, and intellectual uh, dimensions. And by separating these from another, we can't understand what happens to human beings. So let me give you three examples in terms of health of what might be termed the biopsychosocial approach. So we know, for example, from multiple studies that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. So in polluted areas where there is significant irritation of the airways, where asthma is more common, it is the children whose parents are most stressed who are most likely to have asthma. And you say, well, what's the connection between the parent's stress and the child's lung functioning? And the, the connection is actually straightforward and physiologically utterly simple. But it's highly unusual for anybody to go to the doctor with asthma and be asked anything about their childhoods or their relationship with their parents or how they relate to themselves. Now, how do we treat asthma? We treat it with basically two medications combined in an inhaler or separate inhalers or we inject them into people if they're severely asthmatic and one medication is designed to open up the narrow the airways, the other is to suppress the inflammation of the airways. Now, the medication that opens up the airway, the bronchodilator, is actually a copy of adrenaline or it's adrenaline directly. The medication that suppresses the inflammation or which, which is either a copy of cortisol or is cortisol directly. In other words, we're giving cortisol and adrenaline in to make the child's lung function normally. Now, what are adrenaline and cortisol? Does anybody here know what they are? 
They're the stress hormones. So they're the hormones manufactured by our adrenal gland, adrenal, renal kidney, adrenal, top of the kidney. The adrenal gland makes two, and I know I'm speaking fast because I only got 40 minutes. The adrenal gland makes two hormones. One is named after it, adrenaline. And the adrenal gland, like the brain, is a cortex. Cortex means bark, like the bark of a tree. So that makes a hormone named after it called cortisol. Adrenaline, if you're threatened and stressed, will increase your heart rate, send more oxygen to your brain and your muscles, make your muscles stronger so you can fight and escape. Cortisol will elevate your blood sugar so you have more energy for the fight or flight response. That's the stress response. In the short term, that's what they do. What's the connection? The connection is that when parents are stressed, kids are stressed. Because the emotional stresses of the parents invariably and inevitably affect the child. And there's a quote from Almas that illustrates that very beautifully. And he says, the infant, the child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body and can also feel the tension and rigidity and pain in the body of the mother or of anyone else he's with. If the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. The organism does not develop the confidence that it can regulate itself, that things will happen the way they should. So, when parents are chronically stressed, so are children, especially very sensitive children, and that means that their adrenal gland is working overtime. They're releasing cortisol and adrenaline higher than normal or healthy quantities. Their adrenal system gets exhausted, and now we have to give them extra stress hormones to keep their lungs open and uninflamed. Biopsychosocial, the psychological and social relationships with the parents program the biology of the child. And of course, if you ask why are the parents stressed, well, that's a social thing. Parents are stressed because of economic insecurity, because of war, racism, or because of issues unresolved from their own childhoods. But any number of things can stress the parents, which then have an effect on the child. Now, another example of what may be called a biopsychosocial perspective, in other words, illustrating the utter impossibility, invalidity of separating mind from the body and the individual from the environment. Women with breast lumps, 500 in a study in Australia, they were biopsied because they had a lump that was suspicious for malignancy. Before the results came back, the women underwent a psychological interview. When the results were collated, it turns out that if a woman was emotionally isolated, that by itself did not increase the chance of the lump being cancerous. Similarly, if a woman was stressed, that has zero effect on whether the lump was cancerous or not. But if a woman was emotionally isolated and stressed, the risk of that lump being cancerous was nine times as great as the average. Now, the researchers, being Western-trained scientists and medical doctors, couldn't figure this one out. Because they said, how does zero and zero add up to nine? But if you understand the biopsychosocial nature of human beings, it's straight obvious. Because here's the thing. If you're stressed, <clears throat> experience some upset or, th or threat, your, your adrenaline and cortisol levels are going to be high in order to help you deal with the stress. In the short term, that's positive. But let me read you a quote from a, an article published in the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Association. This journal was, this article was published, it's from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And this article was published two years ago. And if only the medical profession understood the implications of this article in a major medical journal, medical practice would be totally different. And here's what they say. Growing, growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the adaptations that a child makes to endure stress in the short term, help him survive, and in the long term, make him sick. Now, if you look at how that works in terms of the stress hormones, 
They've had their value in the acute threat situation, flight or fight. In the long term, what does the adrenaline do? <clears throat> it elevates the blood pressure, it narrows your blood vessels, it increases the risk, it makes you nervous, anxious, and increases the risk of heart disease and strokes. Short-term adaptation, long-term illness. Cortisol in the short term gives you more sugar so you can fight back or escape. In the long term, it thins your bones so you get osteoporosis, makes you depressed, puts fats on your belly so that your risk of heart disease goes up, ulcerates your intestines, and suppresses your immune system. In the realm of modern science and ancient teachings, there exists a fascinating dichotomy between the approaches to understanding and treating illnesses. On one hand, we have the scientific method, which relies on empirical evidence, rigorous experimentation, and the principles of cause and effect to diagnose and cure diseases. On the other hand, we have the teachings of Buddha and other ancient traditions, which emphasize a holistic approach to health, viewing the mind, body, and spirit as interconnected aspects of a unified whole. At first glance, these two approaches may seem contradictory. Science tends to focus on the physical aspects of illness, such as pathogens, genetics, and biochemical processes. While the Buddha's teachings emphasize the role of the mind in creating and alleviating suffering. However, upon closer inspection, we can see that these seemingly disparate approaches actually complement each other in profound ways. For example, modern scientific research has increasingly validated the importance of mental and emotional factors in health and illness. Studies have shown that stress, anxiety, and depression can weaken the immune system, making individuals more susceptible to diseases. This aligns with the Buddha's teaching that mental states can have a direct impact on physical well-being. Furthermore, both science and Buddha teachings emphasize the importance of prevention and lifestyle choices in maintaining health. While science may focus on the biological mechanisms behind these choices, such as diet, exercise, and sleep, the Buddha's teachings emphasize the importance of mindfulness, moderation, and ethical behavior in promoting health and well-being. In conclusion, while the approaches of modern science and Buddha teachings may appear different on the surface, they both offer valuable insights into the nature of illness and health. By integrating these perspectives, we can develop a more holistic understanding of health and wellness. Now let's go back to that Australian study. Let's say you have a woman who is stressed. Something happened. Somebody hurt her or she lost a job or something occurred. But she's not emotionally isolated. So she's sitting there upset and stressed and her hormone levels are high, but somebody, a friend, a trusted companion comes over and says, hey, I see that you're upset. Do you want to talk about it? What happens to her physiology in a split second? Whew. The stress levels abate. The body changes in a minute. The heart rate goes down. She takes a deeper breath, gets more oxygen. The cortisol levels go down. But the woman who's stressed and isolated remains under siege by her stress hormones for a long time, including the suppression of the immune system. No wonder then that the women who are isolated and stressed are more likely to have a malignant transformation in that lump, which is to say that cancer is not the disease of the individual. Cancer in a person reflects a whole set of psychological and social relationships throughout the lifetime. It's only the end point of something that's been going on for a long, long time. And as somebody very astutely said, trying to, un and, and this is why we're not finding the cure for cancer, because we're not looking where we need to. And as somebody very astutely said, a British researcher, he said that, uh, thanks, he said that trying to find the cause of cancer by studying the individual cell is like trying to understand the traffic jam by studying the internal combustion engine. <laughs> <clears throat> now, one, one more example. One more example, at the end of life, we know that a couple has been together for a long time, one of them is hospitalized, the other one has a significant risk of dying. And a British study just three weeks ago showed that when an elderly person is bereaved, their partner dies, you can find measurable 
deleterious changes in the hormonal apparatus and immune systems. In other words, the immune system, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system of the one is modulated by the psychological relationship. So, in understanding illness then, we have to look at this mind-body unity and we have to look at the relationship of that individual to their psychological social environment. So, in, uh, in my years of family practice, and then for seven years, I was medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, which is to say, we looked after terminally ill people. <clears throat> I found that who got sick and who didn't was at all, not at all accidental. That, that there were certain patterns that I inevitably I had to be aware of. And all the people that got sick with chronic illness, whether that be, again, cancer, autoimmune disease, neurological disorders like ALS, MS, Parkinson's, and so on. What these patterns were, and I'm telling you, which may sound dogmatic, but I've been at the game long enough to be convinced of this, that there are no exceptions. I'm going to read you some newspaper clippings that illustrate who is illness prone, and I'll, then I'll tell you why. The first is an article, these are all articles from the Globe and Mail newspaper, which is Canada's national paper, and I wrote a medical column for them for a couple of years. <clears throat> it's by a woman. The first article is by a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her name is Donna. Her doctor's name is Harold, and her husband is called Hi. And Hi's first wife died of breast cancer, and now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And Donna writes in his first-person account of her visit to the doctor's office. Harold tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hai's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about Hai, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, what do you notice? She's the one diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness, We'll have to go through chemo, radiation, possibly surgery. And her first thought is, how will I support my husband emotionally? So this automatic and compulsive regard for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is the major risk factor for disease. Major risk factor. The others that I will read you are actually obituaries from the same newspaper. And obituaries are fascinating because they tell us not just about the person who died, but also about what we value in one another unwittingly. And what we value in one another is exactly what kills us. You've heard, the ex you've heard the expression, the good die young. Half of you are breathing easily right now and you're not worried. <laughs> so this obituary is about a physician who died age 55 of cancer. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on, his, he carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So what would you say to a friend of yours diagnosed with cancer? Go back to work tomorrow, and all the while that you're getting treatment, ignore that, ignore your needs, don't think at all about your life, and just keep working until you drop. So this automatic and rigid identification with duty role and responsibility rather than the needs of the self is the second major risk factor for chronic illness. The biopsychosocial model is a holistic approach to understanding health and illness that considers biological, psychological, and social factors. Unlike traditional biomedical models which focus primarily on biological factors. Like genetics and pathogens, the biopsychosocial model recognizes that health and illness are influenced by a complex interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors. Biological factors refer to the physical aspects of health and illness, including genetics, physiology, and biochemistry. These factors can influence our susceptibility to disease, the progression of illnesses, and our response to treatment. For example, genetic predispositions can increase the likelihood of developing certain diseases, while physiological changes can impact our body's ability to fight off infections. Psychological factors encompass our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, and how they impact our health. Stress, for example, 
can weaken the immune system and increase the risk of developing illnesses such as cardiovascular disease and depression. Similarly, positive emotions and behaviors can promote health and well-being. Social factors include our relationships, socioeconomic status, and cultural background. These factors can significantly impact our health and well-being. For example, social support has been shown to improve health outcomes and reduce the risk of developing certain diseases. On the other hand, socioeconomic factors like poverty can increase the risk of poor health outcomes. By taking a biopsychosocial approach, healthcare providers can better understand the complex nature of health and illness and develop more effective treatment plans. This model emphasizes the importance of addressing not just the biological aspects of health, but also the psychological and social factors that can influence health outcomes. By addressing all three aspects, healthcare providers can promote holistic health and well-being. The next one is written by a husband who is writing this with gratitude about his wife who died age 55 of breast cancer. In her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The word she could say was fui or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. And I'm sure that, like me, many of you have partners, spouses. Sometimes you wish that they would blend in with the environment. <laughs> in an unassuming manner. <laughs> but they won't do that if they want to stay healthy. Because the suppression of the so-called negative emotions, particularly anger, actually suppresses the immune system. And finally, this obituary, which is almost beyond belief, but it's real. This is a physician who died age 72 of cancer. Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife, Roslyn, and their four young kids waited for him at home. Never wanting to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy, until gradual weight came began to raise suspicions. This man suffered from two fatal beliefs. One is that he's responsible for how the people feel. And secondly, that he must never disappoint anybody. So there's four, these four factors, this automatic concern for the emotional needs of others, ignoring your own, compulsive and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the authentic self, suppression of so-called negative emotions, repression of them, and finally, the belief that you're responsible for how the people feel and that you must never, never disappoint anybody so you never say no. These are the significant risk factors that are present in cases of chronic illness, and they're quite capable of killing you for reasons that I'll explain shortly. But before I do, let's explain why people behave in these ways. Are we blaming the patient for the disease? We're not blaming the patient for the disease because these are not deliberate, consciously chosen patterns. Remember that Harvard article I quoted to you? Adaptations that help you survive the immediate uh, stress in childhood, become source of pathology later on. These are all adaptations. Nobody chooses to believe, behave in these ways. And I can give you a personal example. So I, when I was 54 or so, I had uh, arthroscopic surgery on one of my knees. I had a bit of a tear in a cartilage. So that afternoon, I had a bit of a limp. And I'm visiting my mother, who there's a genetic disease in our family called muscular dystrophy which means that if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. But by the way, most diseases are not like that, and there are very few diseases genetically determined. Even in the case of breast cancer, uh, there is a breast cancer gene, or, or several breast cancer genes, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have the gene. The gene is not the major cause of breast cancer. Muscular dystrophy, yes, if you have the gene, rare, but you're likely to have the disease. So my mother had it, so at age 78, she could no longer get out of bed, she could barely feed herself. Mentally, she was very strong. So I'm visiting her, and I'm, as I'm walking down the hall of the nursing home, I have a bit of a limp because of my surgery that morning. When I walk into my mother's room, my limp disappears. 
I greet her with a perfectly normal gait, and I walk out the same way until I shut the door behind me, and again I start limping. Now, what am I doing? I'm protecting her from no knowledge of my pain, but here's the deal. My mother, being 78, has survived the Nazi genocide in Hungary, the communist dictatorship, the Hungarian Revolution in 56, emigration to Canada at the age of 39 with a husband nearly 10 years older and two adolescent boys, life in a new culture and a new language. She was a very strong person. Did she need to be protected from the fact that her middle-aged son had a bit of a limp? <laughs> the afternoon of surgery. However, remember that quote from Amos, that the child feels the suffering of the pain, uh, and pain of the mother. So I was born in January 44 in Budapest uh, to Jewish parents. When I was two, two months old, the Germans occupied Hungary. And you can imagine what the rest of our year was like. And I learned very early that my mother was so stressed that if I wanted to maintain the attachment relationship with her, I better suppress my own pain because she was already overburdened. So that was an adaptation. And that adaptation still shows up in my automatic suppression of my limb. Let it all hang out. In the 1970s, many therapists advocated that the healthiest expression of anger was to let it all hang out, regardless of its impact on others. Perhaps consistent with the rebelliousness of the 60s and the me generation. Of the 70s, they suggested that doing so, as long as it remained verbal, would provide release for anger's tension. In the ensuing years, it was found that doing so actually escalated anger, provoked anger in others, and increased one's stress. To a great extent, this self-absorbed standard unwittingly encouraged a return. To the throes of early childhood, a developmental phase marked by impulsiveness, minimal capacity for self-reflection, and uneven consideration of others. Looking through the lens of neuroplasticity, we know now that such actions only increase the likelihood of their being repeated. While their admonition may not be as direct as let it all hang out, several trends in recent years support its underlying message that feelings should trump reflection. Anti-intellectual sentiments reduce trust in science, and the heightened encouragement to trust one's gut collectively form a powerful force against thinking before acting as a way to address suffering. This mandate calls for trading feelings for thought and is ultimately a petri dish for a culture of destructive anger. By contrast, healthy anger demands reflection. It requires that we take time and exert the effort to empower the rational mind to override the emotional mind. As such, it calls on us to more fully embrace a major aspect of our humanity, our capacities to reason and problem solve. We live in a time when many people view civility and thoughtful discussion as weakness and acting out anger, a virtuous example of strength. And some individuals experience a call for civility as yielding to political correctness. Certain political leaders who stoke anger, as well as the presence of social aggression and bullying in cyberspace. 53 years later. This is what Robin Williams, who died at his own hands after a life of addiction, mental illness, and uh, workaholism called the please love me syndrome. Anything, I'll do anything but love me. See, the child has no choice. The child is in a situation where attachment, and attachment in this case is not in a Buddhist sense, but this is a modern psychological sense, attachment is the drive for closeness and proximity with another human being for the purpose of being taken care of or of taking care of someone else. So there's this powerful attachment drive between all mammals and their children and their offspring, even birds and their offspring. That attachment drive keeps the infant close to the parent, the parent close to the infant, so the infant can be taken care of. And that attachment drive is important to us all our lives, as that example of those elderly couples indicates. In other words, that's the most important dynamic in human life and our brains are largely wired for attachment without which we don't survive because the human infant is the least mature, most dependent and most helpless of any creature in the universe and stays that way for the longest period of time. So without attachment, there's no life. This attachment drive, as I'll be telling you later in my talk on addiction this afternoon, is the source of when the attachment needs are not met, this is the source of all pathology, whether physical or mental. And how does it become a source of physical pathology? Well, because we have another need. 
If you have the need for attachment, you, that's clear. But we have another need, and that is needed for authenticity. Authenticity is a sense of being ourselves and knowing who we are and what we feel. No, that's not a new age, abstract, psychological, spiritual who need. It's actually a survival need. Because to be authentic is to be in touch with your body and your gut feelings. And in the long period of evolutionary development, living in a state of nature amidst all kinds of nature, uh, dangers, how long exactly would a human being survive if they were not in touch with their gut feelings? They wouldn't. So that the, the, the authenticity is as, as, as powerful as the attachment need in the long term. But what happens to a child where the authenticity threatens attachment? And what do I mean by that? Let's say that uh, as a one-and-a-half-year-old, two-year-old, your child is angry at you. And by the way, if you have a one-and-a-half and two-year-old and they're never angry with you, you're not doing your job. Because they can't have five cookies before dinner. And they can't climb on the table to play with a shiny knife. So they're going to get frustrated. So they're going to throw a tantrum, which is what they do. But how if, what about if you grow up in a home where there was a rageaholic father? And the very hint of anger threatens you unconsciously. So you give the message to the child that good little kids don't get angry. In other words, good little, little kids who get angry are not good. They're not acceptable to the parent. Well, guess what? If that message is driven home powerfully enough, the child would repress the anger in order to maintain the attachment relationship. Pure adaptation. But in the long term, that repression of the authentic self, as in the cases I mentioned, is what leads to disease. So this is the please love me syndrome. Love me at any cost. The child, when it comes to attachment versus authenticity, has absolutely no choice in the matter. Because without attachment, they can't survive. Treat me like a fool, treat me mean and cool, but love me. That's not love. Just let me stay attached to you at any cost. Now the problem is that once you make the choice, although it's no choice at all, to go for attachment, then we spend the rest of our lives living that out. And we spend the rest of our lives suppressing our authenticity. Now, how does that lead to illness? Well, it leads to illness for the very simple reason that you can't separate the mind from the body. And we now know scientifically that there's no basis for those separations. So it's not that there's a nervous system and an immune system and a hormonal apparatus and a cardiovascular system and an emotional system. It's all part and parcel of the same system. There's a science that's I would say it's new, but it's only relatively new. It's been around for a few decades now. It's called psychoneuro psychoneuroimmunology that studies the connections and the unity of the emotional system, the immune system, the hormonal apparatus, and the nervous system. It turns out there aren't separate systems, it's just one. To say that they're even connected is, is kind of false because you connect two things that are discrete, but these are not discrete systems. But just the differentiated functioning of the same super system. So it turns out that the nervous system wires them all together like a giant electrical grid. It connects the bone marrow to the brain. It sends messages from the bone marrow to the brain, from the brain to the bone marrow, where our immune and red cells are manufactured, from the thymus gland in the neck, where the white cells are stored, to the brain and vice versa, the gut to the brain, the heart to the brain brain to the heart. The heart itself is a nervous system. It's like a second brain in a sense. It has certain predictive capacities, especially for negative things. We say, I knew in my heart, you did. And that's connected to the brain up here. Then they all secrete messenger substances into the circulation and they talk to one another biochemically so that the, um, the immune cells, the white cells in your circulation have um, the capacity to manufacture every hormone that the brain manufactures. And so the immune system is talking to the brain, and the brain is talking to the immune system. The immune system has been called the floating brain. It's got learning capacity, reactive capacity, and memory, just like the brain does. Then there's the gut-brain connections. Okay. Now, let me ask for the obverse. 
those of you that have a powerful gut feeling, you ignored it and you're grateful afterwards, put your hand up. Now you see how much more the, the majority has it is with the gut. Now I would even argue, had I had time, with those of you that just put your hand up, that what you had was not a gut feeling at all, it was just a strong emotion. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Have you ever had a feeling in your gut that something is either right or wrong, but you can't explain why? This phenomenon, often referred to as intuition, is often thought of as mystical or linked with telepathy and premonitions. However, there is a scientific basis behind it that goes beyond mere superstition. What is intuition? Intuition is the ability to understand something immediately without the need for conscious reasoning. It's about recognizing patterns and making quick decisions based on past experiences and knowledge stored in the brain. The Science Behind Intuition Pattern Recognition Imagine being shown a layout of a chess game for a few seconds. Studies show that while most novices can only recreate 25% of it, chess masters can do so with 95% accuracy. This is not due to photographic memory but rather their ability to recognize patterns developed over years of practice. Slow versus fast thinking our brain processes information through both slow and fast thinking. Slow thinking is used for complex problems, like solving a math equation. While fast thinking is used for immediate responses, like recognizing emotions. Intuition in decision making chess study in a study on the Japanese board game. Shogi, expert players were asked to solve a checkmate move within one second. Brain scans showed no activation of the cortex, the part of the brain responsible for conscious thought, indicating that intuition, linked to the basal ganglia, was at play. House buying study contrary to popular belief, a study found that participants who trusted their gut when buying a house made better choices than those who thought through the process carefully. This suggests that intuition can sometimes lead to better decisions. The role of intuition in simple decisions for simple decisions. Like choosing toothpaste, intentional thought and research can be helpful. However, for complex decisions, trusting your gut might lead to better outcomes. But there's a difference. You know, the gut feeling is there's something calm and knowing about it. There's no agitation about it. But nevertheless, even if I take your word for it, it's still like you know, 30 to 1. So why is the gut so much more intelligent than your thoughts? In other words, when you went with your thoughts, you were wrong. If you pay attention to your gut feelings, you are right. Well, the gut sends many more messages to the brain than come the other way. If you've ever been treated for depression, like I have with, say, Prozac, which elevates serotonin levels, the gut has more serotonin than the brain does. The mood chemical. The gut receives messages from the whole brain and it magnifies them and sends them back up so that when you are listening to gut feelings, you're getting the whole picture. Your intellect, your thoughts are only a very small part of your, uh, of your uh, evaluative apparatus and emotions came much before we had thoughts, necessarily, because without strong gut feelings, again, we just didn't survive. Now, There's a group of people called aphasiacs who can't... Aphasiacs have been shown in a number of studies to be much more astute at knowing when somebody's a liar than people who understand language. Why do you suppose that is? Because they take in the whole picture, the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expression, the congruence of body language, tone, and facial expression. And that's a much more significant markers of truth than the words are. If, if, if aphasiacs voted, no politician would ever get elected. <laughs> but there's another large group of people, but there's another large group of people who, I mean, if you look, you know, I, and, and that may seem like sort of a, a knock on politicians, but let me tell you, um, it was a very interesting phenomenon with, with President George, George Bush Jr. If you ever, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but if you ever turned off the sound on the television and he was speaking, what would you observe? A very nervous and scared little kid. And this guy was the most powerful man in the world, so they say. A scared little kid. Now, there's another large group of human beings who are 
perfectly capable of unerringly reading and reacting to the gut feelings. And what do we call those people? What do we call them? Children. We call them babies. Okay, no one day old baby is disconnected from the gut feelings. When you put your hand up and I ask you, how many of you had the experience of ignoring and then regretting, not having paid attention to gut feelings, you were telling the story of your childhood. The story of your childhood was that when you were born pristine and authentic, completely in touch with yourself, and then you learned that in order to stay attached to your environment, you had to suppress that part of yourself. So the, so the, so the suppression itself became associated with survival. No wonder you're afraid to be authentic. Because there's something in you that says, if I'm authentic, I won't be loved anymore, and if I'm not loved, I won't survive. Then we keep choosing attachment over authenticity, and then we get sick. And then we get sick. The difference between a gut feeling and intentional thought lies in how they are processed in the brain and the sensations they create in our bodies. A gut feeling is often described as an instinctive or intuitive sense about something without a clear logical explanation. It's like a sudden hunch or feeling that something is right or wrong, even though you can't explain why you feel that way. This gut feeling is believed to be connected to the brain's emotional center. The amygdala, which processes emotions and can send signals to the body that something feels off or right. On the other hand, intentional thought is a more deliberate process. It involves conscious reasoning and decision making, where you weigh options, consider consequences, and make a conscious choice. This process is associated with areas of the brain like the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for higher level thinking and planning. The connection between gut feelings and the brain is through the gut-brain axis, a bidirectional communication system between the gut and the brain. The gut has its own nervous system, known as the enteric nervous system, which can send signals to the brain via the vagus nerve. These signals can influence our emotions, mood, and even our decisions, sometimes giving rise to gut feelings. In summary, gut feelings are more instinctive and emotional originating from the gut and influencing our emotions and decisions. Intentional thoughts, on the other hand, are more deliberate and rational, originating from the brain's higher level thinking areas. Both play important roles in how we perceive and navigate the world around us. Let me give you an example. I just need a volunteer, okay? So I mentioned that the suppression of anger suppresses the immune system. So. You're going to volunteer. Thanks. No, you need to stay where you are. What's your name? Judith. Judith. Okay. So there's one, one rule here, only Judith, okay? Which is that the chair that you're sitting in is your life, so you can't leave it, okay? For this experiment. After the talk, you can leave, or, you, or, even, or even before the talk, but not for this experiment, okay? So the question I'm going to ask you is, are you okay with the distance between you and I right now? If I spoke from here for the rest of the morning, is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to stand here and ask you the same question. Is it still okay with you? If I lecture from here, how about right now? Yeah. Is it still okay with you? Okay, what about right now? It's getting a little tight. <laughs> it's getting a little tight? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's still okay. It's still okay. All right, I'm going to put a knee on your knee. You know? <laughs> How's that now? It feels good. It feels good. I'm going to stand on your knee in a minute. No, you're not. You know, okay. okay. How, would, how would that feel to you? You wouldn't like it. What would you do about it? I'd have to push you off. Okay, right. And as you're pushing, what emotion do you think you'd be generating? Fear and anger. Anger. The fear would come first. Yes. And then the anger. Yes. So in other words, the anger is not a negative emotion. It's a healthy boundary defense. Anger, healthy anger simply says, you're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. There's unhealthy anger, but that's different. Healthy anger says, you're my space. Healthy anger is in the present. It's not about the past and the future. It's just, it's a boundary defense, you're in my space, get out. That's it. Now, if you look at the role of emotions in general, what is their job? Now, in another situation with another person, you actually might invite them closer. Perhaps. You know, some people in your life, in some situations, you would invite closer. So the role of emotions is to tell you what you want more of and being closer to you, allow in your space and to keep out the unwelcome and the potentially dangerous. 
That's the whole emotion. Invite in the nourishing, the healthy, the welcome. Keep out the dangerous, threatening, unwelcome. What is the role of the immune system? It's exactly the same thing. The immune system and the emotional system do exactly the same thing. Because of the unity that I've mentioned to you, when you suppress the one, you're suppressing the other. And that's why the repression of healthy anger is a significant risk factor for, for cancer, because the immune system is suppressed now. On the other hand, what else can happen? If, let's say you repress anger. You're one of these really nice people and you're always helping people. You never say no. And the book of mine that this talk is based on is entitled When the Body Says No. My contention being is if you don't, the body will say it for you. I may have said that before. So what happens to anger that you don't express? Does it evaporate, go away, fly to the moon? Where does it turn? It turns against you in a form of depression. What does the word depression mean? It means to push something down. It's that simple. It was an adaptation. Depression begins as an adaptation. You have to push down your feelings to stay attached. 30 years later, you're taking Prozac. And they tell you, you got this genetic disease. Nonsense. The silent war within I never truly understood my body until it started screaming at me, its whispers growing louder each day. Every cell, molecule, and fiber seemed to protest against my actions. It began subtly, with a nagging exhaustion that seeped into my bones. I brushed it off, attributing it to everyday stress. But soon, more signs emerged, colds, headaches, aches. I tried to ignore them, pushing harder to meet work and family demands. But my body rebelled, IT protested my pursuit of perfection. Sending distress signals I could no longer ignore. I realized the deep connection between my emotions and my body. I suppressed feelings, putting on a strong facade for others. But this unleashed a silent war within me, I became a pleaser. Seeking validation and sacrificing my needs for others' happiness. Stress became my constant companion, affecting every aspect of my life. My immune system seemed to attack itself, trying to protect me from internal conflict. I ignored the damage until I broke down, bedridden and depleted. I understood that true strength lies in embracing vulnerabilities, acknowledging limits, and honoring body and soul needs. I started a journey of self-discovery, I listened to my body heeding warnings and embracing emotions as part of my humanity. I nurtured self-compassion, and the weight of the war began to lift. Today, I stand not as a pleaser, but as a warrior for my well-being. With each day, my immune system grows stronger, fortified by authenticity and self-care. I hope this story resonates with what you were looking for. If you need any more assistance or adjustments, feel free to let me know. These are the significant risk factors that are present in case of chronic illness, and they're quite capable of killing you, for reasons I'll explain shortly. But before I do, let's explain why people behave in these ways. Are we blaming the patient for the disease? We're not blaming the patient for the disease because these are not deliberate, consciously chosen patterns. Remember that Harvard article I quoted to you? Adaptations that help you survive the immediate uh, stress in childhood, become source of pathology later on. These are all adaptations. Nobody chooses to believe, behave in these ways. And I can give you a personal example. So I, when I was 54 or so, I had uh, arthroscopic surgery on one of my knees. I had a bit of a tear in a cartilage. So that afternoon, I had a bit of a limp. And I'm visiting my mother who, there's a genetic disease in our family called muscular dystrophy which means that if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. But by the way, most diseases are not like that, and there are very few diseases genetically determined. Even in the case of breast cancer, uh, there is a breast cancer gene, or, or several breast cancer genes, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have the gene. The gene is not the major cause of breast cancer. Muscular dystrophy, yes, if you have the gene, rare, but you're likely to have the disease. So my mother had it, so at age 78, she could no longer get out of bed, she could barely feed herself. Mentally, she was very strong. So I'm visiting her, and I'm, as I'm walking down the hall of the nursing home, I have a bit of a limp because of my surgery that morning. When I walk into my mother's room, my limp disappears. 
I greet her with a perfectly normal gait and I walk out the same way until I shut the door behind me and again I start limping. Now what am I doing? I'm protecting her from no knowledge of my pain, but here's the deal. My mother, being 78, has survived the Nazi genocide in Hungary, the communist dictatorship, the Hungarian Revolution in 56, emigration to Canada at the age of 39 with a husband nearly 10 years older and two adolescent boys, life in a new culture and a new language. She was a very strong person. Did she need to be protected from the fact that her middle-aged son had a bit of a limp? <laughs> the afternoon of surgery. However, remember that quote from Amos, that the child feels the suffering of the, uh, and pain of the mother. So I was born in January 44 in Budapest uh, to Jewish parents. When I was two, two months old, the Germans occupied Hungary. And you can imagine what the rest of our year was like. And I learned very early that my mother was so stressed that if I wanted to maintain the attachment relationship with her, I better suppress my own pain because she was already overburdened. <laughs> So that was an adaptation. And that adaptation still shows up in my automatic suppression of my limp 53 years later. This is what Robin Williams, who died at his own hands after a life of addiction, mental illness, and workaholism, called the please love me syndrome. Anything, I'll do anything but love me. See, the child has no choice. The child is in a situation where attachment, and attachment in this case is not in a Buddhist sense, but this is a modern psychological sense, attachment is the drive for closeness and proximity with another human being for the purpose of being taken care of, or of taking care of someone else. So there's this powerful attachment drive between all mammals and their children, and their offspring, even birds and their offspring. That attachment drive keeps the infant close to the parent, the parent close to the infant, so the infant can be taken care of. And that attachment drive, is important to us all our lives, as that example of those elderly couples indicates. In other words, that's the most important dynamic in human life, and our brains are largely wired for attachment, without which we don't survive, because the human infant is the least mature, most dependent, and most helpless of any creature in the universe, and stays that way for the longest period of time. So without attachment, there's no life. This attachment drive, as I'll be telling you later in my talk on addiction this afternoon, is the source of when the attachment needs are not met, this is the source of all pathology, whether physical or mental. And how does it become a source of physical pathology? Well, because we have another need. We have the need for attachment, you, that's clear. But we have another need, and that is need for authenticity. Authenticity is a sense of being ourselves, and knowing who we are, and what we feel. Now, that's not a new age, abstract, psychological, spiritual who need. It's actually a survival need. Because to be authentic is to be in touch with your body and your gut feelings. And in the long period of evolutionary development, living in a state of nature amidst all kinds of nature, uh, dangers, how long exactly would a human being survive if they were not in touch with their gut feelings? They wouldn't. So that the, the, the authenticity is as, as, as powerful as the attachment need in the long term. The cost of self-neglect how ignoring your needs can lead to serious illness. In the busyness of life, it's easy to prioritize others over ourselves, neglecting our own needs. Yet, this self-sacrificing mindset can have profound effects on our health. When we consistently put others first, we signal to our bodies that our own needs are unimportant. This chronic neglect can result in serious physical and mental health issues. One common outcome of self-neglect is chronic stress. Constantly pushing ourselves to meet the demands of others triggers the release of stress hormones like cortisol. Over time, this can weaken our immune system, making us more susceptible to illnesses ranging from common colds to autoimmune disorders. Mental health is also affected by self-neglect. Ignoring our needs can lead to feelings of resentment and burnout, contributing to anxiety and depression. These conditions further compromise our well-being. The connection between self-neglect and serious illness is clear. When we fail to care for ourselves, our bodies suffer. However, self-care is not selfish, prioritizing our own well-being enables us to be better caregivers, allowing us to care for others more effectively. Next time you feel inclined to neglect your needs, remember that self-care is vital. 
Taking time for yourself isn't selfish, it's necessary for your health and your ability to care for others. By prioritizing self-care, you can protect yourself from the consequences of self-neglect and continue caring for others for years to come. But what happens to a child where the authenticity threatens attachment? And what do I mean by that? Let's say that uh, as a one and a half year old, two year old, your child is angry at you. And by the way, if you have a one and a half and two year old and they're never angry with you, you're not doing your job. Because they can't have five cookies before dinner. And they can't climb on the table to play with a shiny knife. So they're gonna get frustrated. So they're gonna throw a tantrum, which is what they do. But how if, what about if you grow up in a home where there was a rageaholic father and the very hint of anger threatens you unconsciously. So you give the message to the child that good little kids don't get angry. In other words, good little, little kids who get angry are not good, they're not acceptable to the parent. Well, guess what? If that message is driven home powerfully enough, the child would repress the anger in order to maintain the attachment relationship. Pure adaptation. But in the long term, that repression of the authentic self as in the cases I mentioned, is what leads to disease. So this is the please love me syndrome. Love me at any cost. The child, when it comes to attachment versus authenticity, has absolutely no choice in the matter. Because without attachment, they can't survive. Treat me like a fool, treat me mean and cool, but love me. That's not love. Just let me stay attached to you at any cost. Now the problem is, that once you make the choice, although it's no choice at all, to go for attachment, then we spend the rest of our lives living that out. And we spend the rest of our lives suppressing our authenticity. Now, how does that lead to illness? Well, it leads to illness for the very simple reason as you can't separate the mind from the body. And we now know scientifically that there's no basis for those separations. So it's not that there's a nervous system and an immune system and a hormonal apparatus and a cardiovascular system and an emotional system it's all part and parcel of the same system so there's a science that's I would say is new but it's only relatively new it's been around for a few decades now it's called psychoneuro psychoneuroimmunology that studies the connections and the unity of the emotional system the immune system the hormonal apparatus and the nervous system. It turns out there aren't separate systems, it's just one. To say that they're even connected is, is kind of false because you, you connect two things that are discrete, but these are not discrete systems. They're just the differentiated functioning of the same super system. So it turns out that the nervous system wires them all together like a giant electrical grid it connects the bone marrow to the brain, it sends messages from the bone marrow to the brain, from the brain to the bone marrow, where our immune and red cells are manufactured, from the thymus gland in the neck, where the white cells are stored, to the brain and vice versa, the gut to the brain, the heart to the brain, brain to the heart. The heart itself is a nervous system. It's like a second brain in a sense. It has certain predictive capacities, especially for negative things. We say, I knew in my heart, you did and that's connected to the brain up here, then they all secrete messenger substances into the circulation and they talk to one another biochemically so that the, um, the immune cells, the white cells in your circulation have uh, the capacity to manufacture every hormone that the brain manufactures. And so the immune system is talking to the brain and the brain is talking to the immune system. The immune system has been called the floating brain it's got learning capacity, reactive capacity, and memory, just like the brain does. Then there's the gut-brain connections. Okay. Now, let me ask for the obverse. Those of you that have a powerful gut feeling, you ignored it, and you're grateful afterwards, put your hand up. Now, you see how much more the, the majority has it is with the gut. Now, I would even argue, had I had time, with those of you that just put your hand up, that what you had was not a gut feeling at all. It was just a strong emotion. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. But there's a difference. You know, the gut feeling is there's something calm and knowing about it. There's no agitation about it. 
But nevertheless, even if I take your word for it, it's still like, you know, 30 to 1. So why is the gut so much more intelligent than your thoughts? In other words, when you went with your thoughts, you were wrong. If you pay attention to your gut feelings, you were right. Well, the gut sends many more messages to the brain than come the other way. If you've ever been treated for depression, like I have with, say, Prozac, which elevates serotonin levels, the gut has more serotonin than the brain does, the mood chemical. The gut receives messages from the whole brain, and it magnifies them and sends them back up, so that when you are listening to gut feelings, you're getting the whole picture. Your intellect, your thoughts, are only a very small part of your, uh, of your uh, evaluative apparatus. And emotions came much before we had thoughts, necessarily, because without strong gut feelings, again, we just didn't survive. Now, there's a group of people called aphasiacs who can't... Aphasiacs have been shown in a number of studies to be much more astute at knowing when somebody's a liar than people who understand language. Why do you suppose that is? Because they take in the whole picture, the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expression, the congruence of body language, tone, and facial expression. And that's a much more significant markers of truth than the words are. If, if, if aphasiacs voted, no politician would ever get elected. <laughs> but there's another large group of people, but there's another large group of people who, I mean, if you look, you know, I, and, and that may seem like sort of a, a knock on politicians, but let me tell you, um, there was a very interesting phenomenon with, with President George, George Bush Jr. If you ever, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but if you ever turned off the sound on the television and he was speaking, what would you observe? A very nervous and scared little kid. And this guy was the most powerful man in the world, so they say. A scared little kid. Now, there's another large group of human beings who are perfectly capable of unerringly reading and reacting to their gut feelings. And what do we call those people? What do we call them? Children. We call them babies. Okay, no one-day-old baby is disconnected from the gut feelings. When you put your hand up and I ask you how many of you had the experience of ignoring and then regretting not having paid attention to gut feelings, you were telling me the story of your childhood. The story of your childhood was that when you, you were born pristine and authentic, completely in touch with yourself, and then you learned that in order to stay attached to your environment, you had to suppress that part of yourself. So the, so the, so the suppression itself became associated with survival. No wonder you're afraid to be authentic. Because there's something in you that says, if I'm authentic, I won't be loved anymore, and if I'm not loved, I won't survive. Then we keep choosing attachment over authenticity, and then we get sick. And then we get sick. Let me give you an example. I just need a volunteer, okay? So I mentioned that the suppression of anger suppresses the immune system, so you're going to volunteer. Thanks, no, you need to stay where you are. What's your name? Judith. Judith, okay. So there's one... One rule here, only Judith, okay? Which is that the chair that you're sitting in is your life, so you can't leave it, okay? For this experiment. After the talk, you can leave, or, you, or, even, or even before the talk, but not for this experiment, okay? So the question I'm gonna ask you is, are you okay with the distance between you and I right now? If I spoke from here for the rest of the morning, is that okay with you? Okay, now I'm going to stand here and ask you the same question. Is it still okay with you? If I lecture from here, how about right now? Yeah. Is it still okay with you? Okay, what about right now? It's getting a little tight. <laughs> it's getting a little tight? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's still okay. It's still okay. All right, I'm going to put a knee on your knee. You know? How's that now? It feels good. It feels good. I'm going to stand on your knee in a minute. No, you're not. You know, okay. okay. How, would, how would that feel to you? I wouldn't like you it. You wouldn't like it. What would you do about it? Okay, right. And as you're pushing, what emotion do you think you'd be generating? Fear and anger. Anger. The fear would come first. Yes. And then the anger. Yes. So in other words, the anger is not a negative emotion. It's a healthy boundary defense. Anger, healthy anger simply says, you're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. There's unhealthy anger, but that's different. Healthy anger says, you're in my space, get out. Healthy anger is in the present. 
It's not about the past and the future. It's just, it's a boundary defense, you're in my space, get out. That's it. Now, if you look at the role of emotions in general, what is their job? Now, in another situation with another person, you actually might invite them closer. Perhaps. You know, some people in your life, in some situations, you would invite closer. So the role of emotions is to tell you what you want more of and being closer to you, allow in to your space and to keep out the unwelcome and the potentially dangerous. That's all the emotion. Invite in the nourishing, the healthy, the welcome, keep out the dangerous, threatening, unwelcome. What is the role of the immune system? It's exactly the same thing. The immune system and the emotional system do exactly the same thing. Because of the unity that I've mentioned to you, when you suppress the one, you're suppressing the other. And that's why the repression of healthy anger is a significant risk factor for, for cancer, because the immune system is suppressed. Now, on the other hand, what else can happen? If, let's say you repress anger. You're one of these really nice people and you're always helping people. You never say no. And the book of mine that this talk is based on is entitled, When the Body Says No. My contention being is if you don't, the body will say it for you. I may have said that before. So. What happens to anger that you don't express? Does it evaporate, go away, fly to the moon? Where does it turn? It turns against you in a form of depression. What does the word depression mean? It means to push something down. It's that simple. It was an adaptation. Depression begins as an adaptation. You have to push down your feelings to stay attached. 30 years later, you're taking Prozac. And they tell you, you got this genetic disease. Nonsense. In the same way that the anger can turn against you in the form of depression or self-loathing, self-blame, in the same way, the immune system can turn against you so that your immune cells and immune organs that are meant to <clears throat> defend you will not attack you. And that's autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, Crohn's, colitis, fibromyalgia, in multiple sclerosis. I'm going to bring this to a close and I'm sorry I will not have time for questions but I'm happy to hang on afterwards and talk to people. I'm going to close with a quote from my honored teacher Alma, sorry, Hamid Ali, who says, the fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love or support. He's talking about childhood. The greater calamity which was caused by that first calamity is that you lost the connection to your essence. That is much more important than whether your mother or father loved you or not. But that's the good news. Because if the problem was that you were not loved, supported, recognized, honored, or if you were abused 15, 30, 50 years ago, if that was the problem, we're stuck because we can't undo the past. But if the problem was that as a result of those events, be disconnected from ourselves in order to maintain, stay attached. Our cells, our essence is still here and we can reconnect. We can reconnect, so that's the good news. And in that sense, although we tend to look upon symptoms and illness as enemies to get rid of, we talk about the war on cancer, the battle against cancer, we can look up at it totally differently. Yeah, receive what medical treatment makes sense to you. I'm not, I'm a physician, I'm not against medical treatment or medical advancement, but also ask the question, what is my body saying no to that I didn't say no to? What is the meaning of this relapse of my rheumatoid arthritis? What stresses did I impose on myself? Where didn't I say no? And then the illness can actually become your teacher. Your teacher towards what? Towards authenticity. And let me ask you this final question. How many of you know people who have recovered from addiction or some serious illness and some people even who don't recover from a serious illness but will still say and I've heard this many times I'll still say that addiction that illness was the best thing that ever happened to me how many of you heard such statements many of you have I certainly have in my career as a physician what are people talking about they're talking about that the illness forced me to become authentic it gave me back myself which is what almas calls the precious pearl. Thanks very much.
the profound teachings of Dr. Gabor and his enlightening exploration of. The body says no, we are left with a powerful realization. Our bodies are not separate from our minds, they are intimately connected, each influencing the other in profound ways. Dr. Gabor work reminds us that true health is not merely the absence of disease, but a state of balance and harmony between our physical, emotional, and spiritual selves. By listening to the messages of our bodies and addressing the underlying emotional and psychological factors that contribute to illness, we can embark on a path of healing and transformation. Let us carry forward the wisdom of Dr. Gabor teachings remembering that our bodies are wise beyond measure, always guiding us towards greater health and well-being if we are willing to listen. Thank you for joining us on this journey, and may you continue to nurture a deep and compassionate relationship with your body, honoring its innate wisdom and resilience. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to Inside Serene and get notified when we upload a new video. Thanks for watching.